welcome to everybody. Welcome to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour. Arbitration and mediation as a global force for good. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. Please use the chat function to let us know where you're calling in from today. So far, we've had 60 countries represented as panelists at the ADR World Tour. And so we wanna know where you're from. It's a competition, whoever's furthest away, um, maybe we'll send a cookie or something. Um, good morning from Hungary, Gabor. I studied at Central European University. Good morning from America. Again, welcome everybody. We'll be starting in just, ah, Gabor also studied at Central European University. There it is. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk offline. Uh, good morning from the USA, everybody. Welcome to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour. Arbitration and mediation as a global force for good. Folks are still rolling in. We'll give it a few more minutes before we begin. Uh, thank you to the panelists for being here. And thank you to all of the participants from all over the world. Again, please use the chat function to let us know where you're calling in from. Uh, for everybody's reference, we'll have a few poll questions that'll be presented today. We encourage you to please vote. Uh, we will be conducting a comparative analysis at the end of the ADR World Tour, which will be lasting 11 weeks, covering 17 regions throughout the world. So far, we have 1,197 attendees at the ADR World Tour, so we are thankful to have you. Uh, good evening to Surendra in Hong Kong. Surendra wins, I think, the prize from being the furthest away. Uh, maybe equidistant. And then Alexander from Germany, welcome, welcome, welcome. Please use the question and answer function um, during today's presentation with any questions that you might have. Um, good morning. Uh, yes, I think it's morning in Cyprus. Uh, Marina, welcome, welcome. And Samantha, you are in Germany. Uh, we are glad to have you. Thank you so much to everybody. Um, we're gonna give it one more minute and we'll begin. Uh, one technical announcement, if by chance the webinar disappears, just log back on, but we don't anticipate that happening. Um, and all right, Yuvraj from India, greetings, good evening. All right, let's begin. Uh, my name is Brian Brannan, and I serve on the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators North, North America Branch Board of Directors and its Young Members Steering Group. On behalf of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators ADR World Tour, Arbitration and Mediation as a Global Force for Good. The Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Young Members Group presents a series of 11 international webinars, which highlight the unique importance and efficiency ADR plays in allowing the world's economy to remain operative and functional even during times of great economic uncertainty. Perhaps no greater time of economic uncertainty has ever existed than today. 11 regional webinars will focus on ADR and access to justice, ADR as a means to strengthen the rule of law, and ADR as an efficient alternative to traditional litigation. The ADR World Tour is powered by a central organizing group of volunteers covering 15 countries from throughout the world. Today, it is my privilege to be joined by two of those members, Anna Kosmenko and Nata Grobatsi. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Anna and Nata. Please enjoy the show and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Brian, for your introduction. We are very excited to have this seminar today dedicated to the arbitration and other ADR means in the CIS region, which is a very big region, but we got together some representatives, some countries today from that region. Otherwise, of course, we could have a conference for a full day or even for two days. Uh, and we are very happy today being joined by the distinguished speakers representing six countries. And we really hope that you will learn a lot at this seminar and you have all the opportunity to ask questions uh, and to clarify whatever queries you might have regarding ADR in this 
jurisdiction. So the seminar today will be moderated by myself and by Nata Gibratze of Hagen Lovells in Munich, who also co-organized this event. I have to make a little disclaimer that I had to take a flight yesterday, but unfortunately it was canceled and rescheduled to a very unfortunate timing of today in one hour almost. So I will have unfortunately to leave the seminar a bit earlier. Uh, so maybe not everything I can learn today from the speakers, but at least I can try to stay as much as I can. So the idea of the seminar that each of our distinguished speakers today will give an overview or presentation of how ADR works in their countries, in their jurisdictions. And following that presentation, we will have an open floor, we will have a Q&A session. So please listen very attentively, keep all your questions to our distinguished speakers and don't miss your chance to put them to them after their presentations. So the Q&A session will be moderated by Nata. I'll have to disconnect by then, unfortunately. So now without losing too much time on the introductions, I would like to introduce the speakers today uh, who accepted the invitation to join this panel and we are very glad to have them on board. So we'll start with uh, Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan today is represented by Anar Janmamadov, who is a partner of MGB Law Offices in Azerbaijan and has a lot of experience in arbitration. Uh, and he's also an arbitrator at the Arbitration Center of the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs, which is also a partner of this event. And we also have other representatives of this center on board on the panel with us today. So next, Anar's presentations will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Aram Khachatyan, who will tell us today about Armenia and news and developments of ADR in Armenia. Uh, Aram is partner in the Armenian law firm IFLEX. And he is also member of the Arbitrations Association of uh, the Republic of Armenia. So following Aram's presentation, we would welcome Oksana Kotel from Belarus, uh, who will tell us everything about ADR in Belarus. Uh, Oksana is a partner at Gorelsky and Partners Law Firm in Belarus. And she's also a member of the Presidium of the International Arbitration Court, Chamber of Arbitrators at the Union of Lawyers of the Republic of Belarus. Uh, following Aksana's presentation, uh, we will have Valikan Sheikhanov's presentation on ADR in Kazakhstan. Uh, it's, it's really amazing when I'm announcing the speakers, you know, the geography is so great and it's indeed so exciting. Uh, so we will be very much interested, Valikan, also in hearing about developments and trends in Kazakhstan. Um, Valikan is a partner uh, in law firm Equitas and he is also heading the Equitas Dispute Resolution Group, which is a very successful group and ranked by many international rankings, as well as Valihan individually. So next, uh, we will move to Alexander Grabelsky's presentation, who represent Russia, and who will cover all the developments in Russia. Alexander is the managing partner of Grabelsky and Partners in Russia, and he is also the chairman of the panel for international and investment disputes at the Arbitration Center at the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs, which I mentioned previously. Alexander is also an adjunct professor at the Mgimo University in Moscow, Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Um, following Alexander's presentations, and finally, we will have a presentation from Uzbekistan that will be made by Diana Baizakova, who is the director of the Tashkent International Arbitration Center in Uzbekistan. And we couldn't get anyone better to cover arbitration and ADR developments in Uzbekistan because Diana is the only person from Uzbekistan who was ranked by Legal 500 in arbitration power list 
for CIS and Caucasus. So we indeed have very distinguished speakers with us today. And I'm happy to give the floor to the panel and as announced, start with Anar's presentation. Anar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, so as mentioned, I will, uh, I'm representing Azerbaijan and I will be focusing on the major ADR developments in Azerbaijan. Uh, during the recent years, the most important reform, ADR reform in Azerbaijan was made in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sphere of mediation. Two years ago, in March to, to nine, uh, 2019, we had a new law on mediation. Uh, so far, the mediation was not regulated by the law. It was only regulated by the agreement of the parties. But now we have a specific law which regulates all uh, aspects of mediation, starting who can be the mediator, what type of disputes can be referred to mediation, what uh, will be the, how the mediation proceedings will be conducted, and uh, what will be the outcome of the mediation? How the media if 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 the mediation is successful, how this will be enforced? Uh, so uh, under under this law, any person uh, who has an age of over twenty five has a have work experience of three years and uh, passed an induction training. Uh, and is a member of the mediation uh, organization can become um, uh, a mediator. But the most impo important feature of this law is that this law introduces a so-called quasi-mandatory mediation for certain type of disputes. Now under Azerbaijan law, there are three types of disputes which has to go first to the mediation and if the mediation is not successful, then they, a party may bring a relevant claim in the court. And what are these disputes? First is these are the commercial disputes. And by commercial disputes, I mean the disputes between the legal entities or between the private entrepreneurs and the legal entities or the private entrepreneurs themselves. So uh, almost all disputes related to the business uh, now fall within the scope of this uh, new law on mediation. And uh, before filing a claim with the court, the parties must try at least to uh, settle the dispute through the mediation. And uh, the law does not require the parties to go to the full mediation. Under the law, they only are required to attend the first mediation session. And if during this mediation session, they decide that they don't want to go to the full mediation, then the mediator will issue a relevant statement and the parties can, uh, with this statement, they can go and file a relevant claim with the court. But if the mediation, if the parties decide that they want to go to the full mediation, uh, they will sign a relevant agreement with the mediator or the mediation organization, and they will proceed with the full mediation. If the mediation is successful, they will have a settlement agreement, uh, which, can be enforced by the courts or the notaries. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one uh, interesting feature of this law is that it introduces the quasi-mandatory mediation for certain type of disputes. Uh, but this also brings uh, certain uncertainties. Uh, for example, uh, let's say that I have an arbitration clause in my agreement. Am I now required to go to this mediation before filing a, a claim with the arbitration? So what will happen if I don't go to this mediation and go directly to the arbitration? Will I be entitled to enforce an arbitral award in Azerbaijan if I don't follow this mediation proceedings? Uh, the, the, unfortunately, because the law is uh, very new, there is no much practice. Uh, and uh, the uncertainty still exists. For example, there is a risk that if I have this type of arbitration clause in my agreement and I choose not to go to the mediation and then after I win the arbitral and there is an arbitral award in my favor and I want to try to enforce it in Azerbaijan, there will be a risk that the enforcement authority may say that, well, because you didn't follow the mediation proceedings, or at least attended the first mediation session, you're not entitled to have your arbitral award 
recognized and enforced in Azerbaijan because this uh, contradicts with our public policy. So this is one uh, uncertainty. The next uncertainty is that let us, we, we have seen, uh, we see in practice that some agreements already provide uh, the mediation clause. For example, they say that the parties will try to first settle the disputes through, through ICC mediation. And if the ICC mediation is not successful, they will go to uh, the ICC arbitration and so on. Uh, so the question uh, arises, am I required uh, to follow the mediation procedure which is specified in the law if I already have the uh, uh, procedure, mediation procedure, ICC mediation procedure specified in the agreement? I think uh, the answer to this question is still uh, not clear. But the wording of the law suggests that this mediation proceedings, which is specified in the law, is different from the mediation proceedings which you specified in your agreement. Because uh, under that law, there are specific uh, uh, requirements for who can be the mediator, what organizations can be the medi mediator, and the mediation organizations must be members of the Azerbaijani Mediation Council. So this gives uh, the impression that uh, this is a different mediation proceedings and you will have to follow this law before you can go on with the uh, other mediation or the arbitration clause specified in, in, in this agreement. Uh, this is uh, pretty much about the uh, uh, mediation. We're very optimistic that uh, this law will uh, produce very positive results. Uh, and in fact, the reason why this law was uh, introduced is that the government listened to the business community and uh, be, there was a strong uh, request from the business community that they need this type of uh, alternative dispute resolution in addition to arbitration. And this type of alternative dispute resolution was not regulated by the law. And we think that this uh, law will bring some clarities to these issues as well. As regarding the arbitration, they not been uh, any much uh, new development in arbitration. Azerbaijan is still the member of the New York Convention and uh, any foreign arbitral awards can be recognized and enforced in Azerbaijan. So this is pretty much about uh, Azerbaijan. So I will, if, if, if there are questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Anar, for this summary. Um, so I guess, you know, we leave all the questions till the very end. Um, and therefore we will now move to Aram, who will give an overview of what's going on in Armenia. Yes. Uh, hello everyone again. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for your invitation. It's a great pleasure to attend this discussion to get additional information from the region and also to share my our experience regarding the arbitration issues in Armenia. Uh, I have already been, of course, introduced, but um, uh, I will reintroduce myself. <laughs> I'm uh, Aram, a legal practitioner and attorney from Ar Armenia, also a founding member of Armenian Arbitration Arbitrators Association. Uh, and now I'm representing uh, this very organization. Uh, yesterday I get a, a call from Mr. Orbelian, who was, by the way, struggling with COVID, uh, and he was very, very sorry of not being able to attend this meeting, but <clears throat> he did, um, asked me and I was advised to present a general overview of Armenian arbitration ecosystem. And um, from this perspective, I will start, of course, from the legislation. Uh, and of course, uh, I would first say that Armenia uh, is a part of uh, New York Convention. So we, uh, we joined convention in 1997. Uh, in 2006, uh, we adopted uh, an uh, ancestral model law. Uh, uh, it was actually a 1985 version of model law. Uh, 
And of course, we have several arbitration related provisions stated in a civil procedural code, uh, which is basically dealing uh, with the issues of uh, courts, national courts participation in uh, arbitration proceedings, you know, uh, appointment of arbitrators, uh, interim measures, enforcement issues, etc. Um, regarding the case law, uh, I would say that so far we have identified around 10 cases related to arbitration issues. So uh, you may understand that this, this modest number of uh, case law uh, is an indicator that in Armenia, the, the, at least the practice of arbitration is not uh, very uh, developed. So, uh, uh, of course, it is, it is not the uh, most widespread of means of dispute resolution in Armenia. Uh, the reasons are really, really different, uh, but um, the fact is that here uh, we have um, uh, several arbitration institutions operating uh, and uh, most actively operating ones are the, those that are, uh, I would say, uh, niche players uh, who are dealing basically with uh, collection claims coming from the financial institutions. Uh, I'm referring to mostly the commercial banks. Uh, these institutions are Armenian fi Financial Arbitration Institution of Armenia and Optimus Lex Arbitration Center. Um, but uh, if we are talking about more uh, general, the, the arbitration centers with more general profiles, of course, we have such centers as well. Now, uh, and most prominent one is the uh, arbitration institution, Armenian arbitration institution at the Chamber of Commerce. But unfortunately, I can say that the overall caseload is not that much at that institution as well. So they are, uh, as far as I'm informed, they are listening uh, or the, uh, accepting uh, one, two cases uh, yearly. So uh, I, I don't really know what is the reason for this uh, little caseload. Maybe their uh, rules are, no, are, are not that flexible. Maybe the market positioning uh, is not uh, uh, done very well by their, uh, uh, by, by their staff. Uh, but uh, we have what we have. Uh, uh, now, uh, with uh, Mr. Orbelian and uh, Ms. Avanesian from the Arbitrators Association, we joined our efforts to establish a new arbitration institution, which will be called the uh, Yervan Arbitration Institution. Uh, we, uh, as of now, we have finalized uh, the main package of arbitration rules, uh, and we hope that uh, very, very soon we will launch uh, this organization officially and we will uh, put uh, much efforts for raising the awareness about this peaceful resolution model in Armenia and uh, uh, also, also promote the arbitration as much as possible. Because my per personal uh, point uh, of view is that the main reason of uh, the uh, restricted usage of the arbitration is uh, really the lack of awareness about uh, the, the, the effectiveness of this uh, dispute resolution model uh, and particularly among the legal community uh, of Armenia. Uh, from this point of view, I want to stress that uh, in, in 2019, we, uh, with the support of European Council, established the, the Armenian Arbitrators Association, which I'm representing now. Uh, this, this is not the arbitration institution, of course, if, uh, you may understand from this, uh, the name. Uh, the aim of this institution, the, of this organization is to join uh, not only the arbitrators, but also uh, people interested in arbitration. 
uh, we created some kind of a platform where all these these kind of people can find um, important and necessary practical information like the list of available arbitration arbitrators for ad hoc cases and also we managed to uh, kind of uh, uh, localize the ancestral arbitration rules uh, to, to modify them a little bit to be uh, used uh, in Armenia without any restrictions or problems. Uh, within this uh, arbitrators association we also initiated uh, educational processes or programs uh, and we are trying to educate not only the students, but also legal practitioners and even uh, judge, judges from the national courts. Uh, of course, the situation with COVID uh, plus the uh, war that uh, our community, our people faced during last year, and as a result, very, very unstable political situation in Armenia now, uh, are restricting heavily the all kind of actions of developing the uh, arbitration. Uh, but we are looking towards futures and working for having a better environment for arbitration and, and to turn Armenia finally into a more pro-arbitration country. Actually, this is all I wanted to share with you. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Aram. That was really interesting um, as well. And thank you to all of you for keeping to your time. Uh, so now we are moving to Belarus. So, and Oksana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. So good afternoon, dear participants of today's webinar. Thanks, many thanks, Anna, for invitation. And I'm happy to be here and to provide you with uh, some insights on the current situation of ADR situation in Belarus. And for your convenience, I will show you uh, some small presentation uh, to best for best understanding the material just a second so okay so everything is okay can you see the presentation so i can yes yeah i hope so, everyone can, ask, can as well um so every year of course and um, especially in pandemic times um, the number of arbitration cases are in, is increased and Belarus is not an exception. And um, despite any criticism on Belarusian legal system, I must admit that it is very friendly uh, to arbitration. And in Belarus, you can see, uh, as you can see on the slides, we have arbitration friendly legislation and environment. Uh, favorable attitude of state courts, it means uh, the possibility to apply interim measures, this possibility to recognize and enforce foreign arbitral awards, absence of any inter interference of the state courts to the activity of international arbitration courts. We have two major permanently operating international arbitration courts located in Minsk. Um, growing annual number of arbitration cases um, and uh, I should say that um, arbitration dispute resolution in international arbitration um, is more expensive and slower than in state courts in state Belarusian courts but much cheaper and generally faster than foreign alternatives uh, we have online arbitral proceedings adopted and accepted, especially in uh, these difficult pandemic times. Uh, we now it's um, interesting times for Belarus because we have four pending investment arbitration proceedings um, 
covered by different arbitration rules under ancestral arbitration rules, exceed and exceed additional facility rules. So as you know, uh, Republic of Belarus is a member of different bilateral and regional investment treaties. And in 2017, Belarus faced its uh, um, our first investment case and now in 2021, we have four pending investment arbitration. And uh, our firm, Goretzkin and Partners, we represent the interest uh, the Republic of Belarus in such proceedings as a local council. Uh, for us, it is, of course, a unique experience and uh, for Belarus also a unique experience to represent uh, their interest in such investment treaty arbitrations. So, um, in um, what concerns other uh, alternative dispute resolution means, so, uh, such mediation, cancellation, um, are, they are not developed in Belarus. We have uh, law on mediation adopted even in 2013, but since uh, that time, uh, mediation uh, wasn't uh, pop wasn't popular in the com among companies and the most popular method of uh, ADR is international commercial arbitration still it's uh, the rea re reality uh, in Belarus so in addition to in addition to international arbitration courts uh, we have also the system of domestic arbitration courts so we have 20 or approximately 30 local arbitration courts uh, but uh, they uh, these uh, the, the competence of such courts is formally wider than the jurisdiction of international arbitration courts but they mostly consider internal commercial disputes between to residents and um, such disputes as well as labor and family disputes. So it's also uh, not so popular in Belarus, like of course, international commercial arbitration courts. We have another arbitral institution operating in Belarus. It is a commission of the Belarusian Universal Commodity Exchange institution. Uh, this institution specialized in disputes from stock traders. And um, if we speak about re relevant legislation, uh, Belarus uh, is a member of uh, um, many international um, conventions. It is New York Convention on Recognition and Enforcement of Arbitral Awards. It is the European Convention on International Commercial Arbitration. Belarus is a part uh, of Convention on the Settlement of Investment Disputes, it's exceed Convention. We have law on international uh, arbitration. It's adopted in uh, 1999 and uh, in 2014 uh, it was uh, some amendments uh, we have commercial procedural court uh, which provide um, assistance of the state court to international arbitration and we have resolution of the plenum of the supreme court of the republic of belarus uh, which regulates uh, the main um, uh, questions uh, related to recognition and enforcement of foreign court decisions and foreign uh, arbitral awards. It's about legislation. If we, can, if we speak about arbitrability, uh, in Belarus, arbitrable are uh, any civil disputes of economic nature, including corporate and IP disputes and non-arbitrable are any disputes any tax administrative disputes so with uh, some public uh, involving public um, uh, element and the um, main uh, point uh, I just uh, want to draw your attention uh, that we have in Belarus, we have uh, mandatory bifurcation of the proceedings if any jurisdiction objection is raised. So it means that their arbitral tribunal sh shall issue, uh, issue the question on the jurisdiction before any award on the merits. And uh, the party cannot change this provision of the legislation in their arbitration agreement. So and the final decision 
um, the presidium of the chamber of um, arbitrators or the um, uh, international arbitration court at Bill CCI makes a final ruling on the issue of uh, the question on jurisdiction. Uh, if we speak about interim measures, uh, there are two possible ways to, to introduce interim measures. Uh, first one, when the arbitral tribunal itself can issue ruling on application of interim measures. However, in Belarus, there is currently no valid mechanism uh, to uh, enforce uh, such a ruling upon the party because uh, the applicable uh, proceedings allows the enforcement of only final arbitral awards. And the second, uh, the second way uh, is um, the situation when arbitral tribunal or a party may apply to the state courts uh, with a petition to apply interim measures. And in this case, the relevant court uh, will render a ruling such a petition which will be enforceable in a regular way. It's um, uh, convenient and state courts uh, in most cases tries to, to apply such measures if of course party uh, can, uh, can show um, uh, the necessity of applying such interim measures. So in Belarus, we have major international, uh, two major international arbitration institutions. The first one is International Arbitration Court at the Belarusian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, um, founded in 1994. And the second uh, Chamber of Arbitrators uh, at the Union of Lawyers, and um, I uh, must um, admit that ad hoc arbitration and I um, just said mediation have not gained popularity as ADR means and are not used in practice. So if we speak about uh, ADR in Belarus, uh, we usually speak uh, about international commercial arbitration and uh, uh, there is um, a good opportunities to uh, uh, resolve disputes in such arbitration centers. And if we speak about international arbitration courts, it has well established, uh, well established reputation. Uh, and uh, in the period of uh, 2014, uh, 2019, each year it uh, receives around 100 uh, cases involving parties from various jurisdictions, main, mainly from Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Austria, Germany, and China. Unfortunately, we, but maybe not unfortunately, we, we do not have cases uh, at the International Arbitration Court, any cases from Azerbaijan, Armenia, Kazakhstan, um, so maybe uh, it's uh, no, not a great number of uh, maybe contracts concluding with uh, um, the parties of uh, such countries, but frankly speaking, uh, we have some economic disputes from uh, parties from Kazakhstan, but in state economic courts. So another uh, institution is a chamber of arbitrators. It's a younger arbitration institution. Um, it's, uh, estab it was established in 2010 and currently receiving its first cases. And last year, the Union of Lawyers appointed the new presidium of the Chamber of Arbitrators, and which includes experienced arbitrators from Belarus, Ukraine, Russia, Kazakhstan, and Switzerland. And my colleague Anna Kazmenka, who is a moderator of our session today, is only a member of uh, the presidium Presidium of the Chamber of Arbitrators. And the newly appointed Presidium has recently adopted the new arbitration rules, uh, which entered into force on the 1st January 2021. And the Presidium has also updated the advisory list of arbitrators, which now includes arbitration practitioners from more than 15 jurisdictions. And um, the main features of the new arbitration rules, so the first one is we um, uh, we tried to, to make it entirely based on the ancestral arbitration rules uh, 2010 edition. 
and we try to implement of the best world standards for effective conducting proceedings, taking into account, of course, the specifics of the arbitration, permanent court of arbitration, and the mandatory provisions of national Belarusian legislation. Uh, time efficiency, efficiency um, of the arbitral proceeding, six months as a general rule, uh, moderate arbitration fees uh, and possibility to the parties to uh, pay uh, arbitration fees in equal shares. Uh, broad powers of the arbitral tribunal to conduct uh, the arbitral proceedings effectively and the possibility of course of online hearings. So we hope that uh, these new arbitration rules uh, makes uh, to develop the popularity of chamber of arbitrators among Belarusian and foreign parties. And we hope that uh, chamber of arbitrators will become uh, a good and co competitive uh, uh, alternative uh, to our the first international arbitration institute at the uh, international arbitration court at the Bell CCI. So now we try to do all, all our best uh, to make to make it popular in, among Belarusian and foreign countries. So um, just uh, about recognition and enforcement, we have uh, only minor uh, two or three percent proportion of awards uh, that uh, wasn't being enforced uh, due to the member of New York Convention. Of course, Belarusian state courts, uh, in most cases, uh, uh, enforce, recognize and enforce uh, foreign arbitral award. And uh, one, uh, the last. Uh, point uh, that I want to admit that Minsk, uh, I think that is to be considered an attractive seat of arbitration uh, for different country parties, especially from Eastern Europe and CIS region uh, for the following reasons, uh, because living, travel, food, accommodation and other costs are significant lower than in other CIS jurisdictions, for example, Moscow, Kiev, Astana, or of course, oriented cities, London, Geneva, Vienna. Uh, no recognition is required in Belarus. The arbitral award can be enforced immediately. And uh, Belarus is a neutral jurisdiction. It means, uh, so in a dispute, for example, between Russian and Ukrainian, and Ukrainian company, Kazakhstan, for example, between Azerbaijan company. Uh, so we have two permanent international arbitration institutions. Uh, with modern arbitration rules. So welcome to Minsk and we will be happy to assist you with international arbitration in Belarus. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Oksana, for your comprehensive presentation. We've learned certainly a lot about ADR arbitration in Belarus. So now we are moving to, sorry, to Russia. Um, oh no, sorry, to Kazakhstan. So Valikhan, the floor is yours. Please tell us about developments of ADR in Kazakhstan. What is going on? Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I don't see every uh, everyone's faces, but I hope you are smiling. Uh, yeah, I've been listening to my colleagues from Belarus and then I've been watching what's going on in Ukraine, and I'm frankly jealous, very jealous. Uh, was, uh, I think the development is very positive and systematically positive. And unfortunately, I think in Kazakhstan, things are not that, um, that good, so far at least. Um, I think, uh, I don't remember who, I think it was Gary Bond who very aptly noticed uh, that uh, you can have an arbitration more developed than your judiciary, the quality of your judiciary. And uh, the good news uh, that pandemic has not significantly affected the quality of Kazakhstan judiciary, because the, the, the quality of Kazakhstan judiciary was already bad and hardly anything could make it worse. But 
joking aside, uh, well, I think one of the most attractive developments in our part of the world is the in our jurisdiction is the establishment back in 2017 of the Astana International Financial Center, um, which is uh, essentially not a free economic zone, but it's uh, a completely parallel jurisdiction. And I say it's completely parallel jurisdiction because uh, it uh, reflects all the all the uh, features of an independent jurisdiction. It has a separate uh, judiciary, which is not subordinate to the Supreme Court of Kazakhstan, uh, comprising of foreigners, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for the moment uh, of English lawyers exclusively, uh, most of whom are former uh, justices. Uh, it has its uh, separate regulatory environment, which is not subordinate to the highest representative body of the Republic of Kazakhstan, which is the parliament. So uh, it's a, a completely separate set of rules that you have there. And also you have a separate executive, uh, which is not subordinate to the government of the Republic of Kazakhstan. So what we have at the end of the day, we have a parallel jurisdiction. Um, so whenever you now refer to Kazakhstan, you're no longer referring to a, a unitary republic as it is still declared in, the, in our constitution. Rather you have a classic offshore uh, and I call it offshore, I mean, for a number of reasons, but some, uh, one of them is that you have your owners of companies registered within the AIFC uh, completely hidden. So um, there are some uh, tax regime uh, benefits uh, that you have, but I don't think that's the key, the key benefit of the AIFC. Uh, most of my clients are foreign investors, so I usually uh, try to look at situation long term and systematically. And if I were your counsel, I would definitely advise you against subjecting your disputes to uh, AIFC courts or even arbitration. I mean, that's, I think I'm one of the few, if not the only commercial law in Kazakhstan who would say so. But frankly, uh, I mean, uh, that's what I would tell my client. That's what I say my client. If you have an option to subject your dispute to a developed civilized jurisdiction, then you should definitely do that. Because in a long-term perspective, we don't know what will happen with the AIFC. It was um, actually introduced uh, through 30 amendments to the Kazakhstan constitution adopted within two hours unanimously by the parliament with no referendum, uh, with a uh, very uh, severe uh, constitutional violation of the procedure, uh, putting aside the fact that we are still declared by the constitution a unitary republic. But in, in any case, we have what we have. So <clears throat> uh, we have a separate parallel jurisdiction uh, with its own uh, separate bunch of uh, uh, bench of justices, sorry. Um, uh, and uh, it also has uh, its own arbitration center uh, and those uh, arbitration awards that are rendered uh, uh, with uh, AIC as the seat uh, can be uh, enforced, I mean, both uh, within the IFC and in Kazakhstan and uh, benefit from the Euro uh, European and New York conventions that Kazakhstan uh, has exceeded. Uh, well, now uh, switching back to the Republic of Kazakhstan, the main land Kazakhstan, is, uh, uh, if you will. Um, well, one of the one of the I think uh, important issues to raise is uh, whether the status of the New York and European conventions. Um, in Kazakhstan, and that's what I uh, frequently uh, like reiterate, but I think it uh, 
um, it's important. Uh, many uh, think that Kazakhstan has ratified the New York and European Convention, which is not correct, actually. Um, because when uh, the president of Kazakhstan back in 2015 in October um, exceeded uh, Kazakhstan to these two conventions, he did so um, in his capacity of president. And at that time, we didn't have parliament. And there was a period of time when we didn't have parliament at the very early stage of our uh, independence. And all the uh, legislative uh, powers of the parliament were vested with uh, the president. Uh, so he was wearing two hats. So he could act as uh, a president, as the head of executive, or he could uh, act as the uh, head of uh, instead of the parliament. So uh, he had uh, the power to exceed Kazakhstan to these two conventions with his decree of a president, or he could have exceeded uh, the, uh, uh, the country to these conventions with a decree having the power of the law. So he opted for the first option. So uh, currently, uh, legally, technically, uh, Kazakhstan exceeded to the conventions, but they are they do not have the status of ratified conventions so where where, where there is a contradiction between uh the law and arbitration is being regulated including issues related to enforcement of foreign arbitral awards are regulated not only by the new york and european conventions but also by the law on arbitration and the civil procedural law so where there is a contradiction and there are instances where the contradiction may occur and those contradictions are very significant, uh, the question arises whether uh, the convention should prevail and the answer de is dependent on the status of those conventions. And if they are not ratified, then the laws uh, would prevail. Um, so this is um, this is another yeah, uh, issue to bring your attention to. Court practice. We still have a big, big problem with uh, the access to the uh, court uh, judgments or court acts database, which searchability is very much limited. So one can hardly get a picture, uh, unlike in Russia or Ukraine, for instance, uh, on the court practice, including related to issues of uh, uh, recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. So that is another big problem. Um, there is also a big uh, uh, doctrinal vacuum in which uh, Kazakhstan lawyers have to operate. There are lots of issues that uh, we uh, still have to address such issues as the nature of arbitration agreement. And this is very important actually, because when it comes to uh, such questions as the right choice of law, including the, govern the, 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 the law governing the arbitration agreement, the law governing the arbitration procedure and the validity of the arbitration agreement, um, it is important, particularly if you want to quit the Kazakhstan jurisdiction. Uh, very frequent, and it's a very practical matter, and we spend a lot of time negotiating arbitration clauses with, uh, on behalf of our clients, mostly investors with a uh, company, particularly state-owned company, and the Ministry of Justice of Kazakhstan, which represents the Republic of Kazakhstan in large uh, investment contracts where, uh, where we want to make sure that the arbitration, first arbitration agreement will not be invalidated tomorrow. And secondly, um, even if the arbitration agreement is valid, it will not, the arbitration award rendered under that agreement is uh, enforced uh, later on in Kazakhstan. And there are lots of issues related to the 
uh, requirement, which we have in the law on arbitration for an arbitration clause uh, to which uh, a state enterprise or a legal entity with direct or indirect participation of the state um, and the state itself, uh, which is a very frequent uh, situation where in an economy with a very large percentage of uh, the state capital, um, uh, be uh, like approved by the uh, competent state authority. So there is an explicit requirement that um, dependent on a party to an arbitration agreement, you might require uh, you might require uh, an approval of the competent state body and would still have this requirement. And it's a still a very strong impediment to the, uh, de uh, to the development of arbitration in Kazakhstan in particular, but it also creates very practical impediments to, uh, for foreign investors who want to make, to, who, want, who are agreeable to Kazakh law as the governing law of the contract, but they won't resolve their disputes outside of Kazakhstan. And uh, it requires a very nuanced and sophisticated and detailed approach to drafting the arbitration clause and negotiating that with the other side, which is um, frequently the state or uh, state enterprises. So I think I will cut myself off here because I uh, see that my time is uh, over. Uh, but thank you very much. There are lots of issues that uh, could have been addressed uh, and I would be happy to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Valihan. That was indeed very insightful, I would say. And uh, I would now pass the floor to Alexander, who represents the Russian jurisdiction. And I would also pass the moderation to Nata from now on, because I have unfortunately uh, to catch, I have to catch my flight, but enjoy the rest of the seminar of this interesting discussion. And I very much look forward to meeting those of you who I haven't met in person yet and seeing you in the not so distant future. Thank With you, that, Anna. Have, have a good flight. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Alexander, I think the floor is yours now, please. Uh, uh, so I'm most grateful to Anna and Nata for their kind invitation. And it's my pleasure to greet the participants on behalf of the Arbitration Center at the RSPP. Since one of the topic of our event is the development of ADRs and trends in this area, I'd like to say that without exaggeration, in my opinion, Russia remains a trendsetter in international arbitration. And we're talking about both commercial disputes and investment disputes, and even about sports arbitration. I think that if factories stop burning in Russia, then the English courts will never be able to determine which law applies to the arbitration agreement as we see it in the case of Enka versus Chubb. Uh, in the same way, uh, without the Yukas case, for example, the world community will not be able to understand who they are, these mysterious foreign investors. So I can assure everyone who is listening to this that within uh, the Russian jurisdiction, even more interesting things are taking place. Uh, these processes are largely related to the fact that this year we will celebrate the fifth anniversary of the adoption of the law on domestic arbitration and the new edition of the law on international commercial arbitration which were part of the so-called reform of arbitration proceedings. Uh, I would like to briefly remind the audience of what arbitration reform is in Russia was. Uh, the aim of the reform was to improve the arbitration climate in Russia. In particular, the reform was aimed at eradicating unscrupulous arbitration institutions. They were a lot according to various uh, estimates from 1,000 to 3,000, which administered arbitration for various um, bad faith purposes, often making fraudulent awards in order to transfer assets abroad, 
legalizing illegal transactions with real estate and so on. Uh, at the same time, such arbitration centers tried to pass themselves for state courts, often using their symbols and even names. So in this sense, the goal of a legislator who decided to eradicate such abuses through reform was very noble. But to achieve this goal, the legislator used tough methods. Uh, first, uh, the new set of rules for the creation of permanent arbitration institutions was introduced. So now the creation of a new arbitration center requires a special permission from the Ministry of Justice uh, of the Russian Federation based on the recommendation of, of the Council for the Improvement of Arbitration. This council is a special advisory board under the Ministry of Justice, which consists of scientists, practitioners, and other specialists in the field. As a result, instead of uh, several thousand arbitration centers, only five arbitration institutions currently operate in Russia. Two of these five arbitration institutions have special competence. These are the Maritime Arbitration Commission, and the National Center of Sport Arbitration. These institutions consider a small number of uh, disputes within their framework. And the majority of cases is considered by, by only uh, free arbitration institutions. The International Commercial Arbitration Court at the Chambers of Commerce and Industry of the Russian Federation, the oldest arbitration institution, which uh, turns 90 next uh, year, uh, the Arbitration Center at the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs, which acts as the legal successor of several arbitration courts created long before the reform. And the Russian Arbitration Center, which is a relatively new arbitration institution. And uh, it's, I believe, at the very beginning of its journey, but is actively promoting arbitration, especially among the new generation of professionals. Uh, nevertheless, some institutions, which in my opinion, uh, had the right to apply for permission due to the certain positive uh, reputation they had, did not receive a recommendation from the council. Uh, it's worth hoping for a softening of this approach, since the new Minister of Justice of Russia in the past himself headed the arbitration stand at the large corporation, Gazprom, and itself was once a target of criticism. At the same time, the new legislation established uh, that foreign arbitration centers may administer disputes within Russia, again, only after receiving special permission from the Ministry of Justice. Currently, only two foreign arbitration centers have received such permission the Hong Kong and the Vienna centers. However, I haven't heard uh, of any proceedings that would be administered according to uh, their rules uh, on the territory of Russia. Uh, <clears throat> also, the individuals who stood behind this large number of false arbitration institutions prior to the reform have not really disappeared. Uh, they began to provide the illegal services through the use of ad hoc arbitration. So this type of arbitration was severely limited within the framework of the reform. Uh, in Russia, corporate disputes cannot be considered in ad hoc arbitration. The parties of uh, two such proceedings and the arbitral tribunal uh, itself cannot apply to a state court for assistance in obtaining evidence. Uh, the parties to ad hoc arbitration cannot agree to exclude the setting aside proceedings for the final award, and so on. Uh, and then the legislator took even more radical steps. He banned all advertisements offering dispute resolution services in an ad hoc, uh, in ad hoc arbitration. Next important aspect of the uh, reform is uh, the resolution of the arbitrability issue. As many remembers, uh, uh, these issues have been very controversial in Russia, Russian court practice. 
For example, until 2011, state courts recognized disputes involving real estate as non-arbitrable. Further, before the reform, corporate disputes were also recognized as non-arbitrable. Uh, in this sense, uh, the reform has brought certain positive results. For example, the arbitrability of corporate disputes was recognized. Uh, at the same time, uh, certain uh, categories of such disputes may be considered only under special arbitration rules for corporate disputes. And for example, our arbitration uh, institution uh, had to prepare and deposit special corporate rules. Uh, in my opinion, the most important innovation of the reform was the updated version of Article 7 of the Law on International Commercial Arbitration, which states that when uh, interpreting an arbitration agreement, any doubts should be interpreted in favor of its validity and enforceability. And now more and more state judges refer to this article to substantiate their position which is very nice, obviously. But uh, legislative changes uh, by themselves would be useless without the creation of pro-arbitration approach by state courts. And at the end of 2018, the Supreme Court of Court Practice related to the system. Alexander, sorry, I don't know if everybody has the issue. I think you're getting cut off and control to uh, domestic and international commercial arbitration. Alexander, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. You got I cut off the, the, the past one minute. We didn't hear anything, so I don't know if... Uh-huh. So I'm sorry, uh, uh, no, but I believe I should proceed because I... Yes, I'm please go ahead. Yeah. So, yes, I, I uh, was speaking about the uh, uh, review of the court practice which was approved by the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation uh, related to the assistance and control uh, in relation to domestic and international commercial arbitration. And this is very voluminous document consisting of 26 uh, recommendations with fairly progressive pro-arbitration positions. And at present, the courts are also very actively using them. Uh, so finally, one of the latest legis legislative uh, changes in the field of arbitration was the introduction of criminal liability against arbitrators for bribery as a fulfillment of the Russian international obligations before the group of states against corruption, so-called Greco. So despite criticism of the reform, uh, we at the Arbitration Center at the RSPP see its positive results. One of our post-reform achievements is the opening of a whole network of regional offices throughout Russia. If earlier arbitration in the regions uh, had reputation as something nearly criminal, now we see an interest in civilized dispute uh, resolution. In particular, in 2020, we uh, got 41 internal cases in our regional offices. Also, oddly enough, uh, the period of the pandemic was successful for arbitration in Russia. So in 2020, we got a record number of uh, cases. Uh, it was 435 claims and the center resolved uh, 350 cases in various fields. So in conclusion, I would gladly state that at the beginning of, of uh, 2020, we created a specialized panel for the resolution of international and investment uh, disputes, which now unites over 120 specialists from 25 leading jurisdictions. And the panel has already begun to consider international disputes and already new conditions when virtual hearings have become the main format for their consideration. So thank you. Thank you, Alexander, for a very insightful presentation, although just, you know, fitting within 10 minutes. And finally, we come to Uzbekistan. Diana, you were introduced already as the representative of the Tashkent International Arbitration Center. I think the entire community is actually interested in this new, or, or at least for many of us, the, the new institution. So please go ahead. The floor is yours. I think I need to unmute you. I think you need to unmute yourself. Sure. Now we can hear you. Second, I just want to make sure that I can 
Um, sorry. Well, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Super. Well, it is indeed my delight and uh, pleasure to speak today um, about the latest developments and uh, share with all of you today some institutional experiences from Uzbekistan, which has um, only recently appeared under the radar, but has already managed to earn um, a number of um, accolades from various organizations and publications, um, including uh, The Economist, which named Uzbekistan in 2019 as the country of the year, and uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, which referred to Uzbekistan as one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Uh, so when I was uh, approached by the organizers to um, give an overview of the jurisdiction and the latest developments in Uzbekistan, I thought that uh, no such uh, overview or presentation would be complete um, without uh, a very brief introduction to the Tashkent International Arbitration Center, or TIAC as we refer to it. Uh, TIAC, um, or the, its establishment and uh, the launch in April uh, 2019 uh, during Paris Arbitration Week, uh, that was uh, um, potentially one of the two uh, key uh, milestones in the history of international arbitration in Uzbekistan, uh, with the second um, milestone being the recognition, the official recognition by Ancetral of Uzbekistan as a model of jurisdiction very recently. Uh, TIAC as an institution uh, was established um, in um, April 2019 and uh, since then has been up and running as a fully uh, functional um, arbitral institution. Um, we all know that arbitration is uh, in becoming increasingly popular um, in, uh, globally and in particular in uh, our CIS region. And uh, there are uh, a number of established arbitral institutions uh, that uh, have been historically attracting disputes uh, from the CIS region. And in view of this background, when I was assigned um, with the task to establish um, an arbitration center in Uzbekistan, literally from scratch, I um, thought that it was not only important for TIAC to comply uh, with international best uh, practices and uh, standards, but it was also important for us to create and deliver some uh, form of unique value proposition to our uh, prospective users. So what are those uh, five um, distinctive features or reasons to choose TIAC uh, for uh, your next uh, arbitration? A uh, reason number one is that TIAC doesn't charge an admin fee as an administering institution. So it's literally zero. And for your convenience and reference, we've created a um, little comparative table uh, for of arbitration costs uh, for a, a million dollar dispute. And um, if you look at this table, uh, you may, uh, get an insightful um, conclusion that you may um, save about 30% on arbitration costs. And um, well, you may ask us a question and we've been asked this uh, over and over again, then how do we survive? Uh, we cover our operational expenses and um, operational um, fees from, from uh, the um, events that we organize from the memberships and from the educational activities. But most importantly, the members of the TIAC Court of Arbitration, which is the only body within the structure of the center that is in charge of um, administering the dispute, 
uh, and uh, in, is in charge of matters like arbitrator appointments, uh, deciding on jurisdictional or arbitrator challenges, is composed of uh, members uh, whose role in the TIA court is rather honorary. So um, in other words, they work on a pro bono basis. And um, just for your information, I think it's also very important for us to emphasize, uh, we, ha we haven't really reinvented the, the wheel in this context. Um, a lot of other arbitral institutions, including those that lead in the international rankings, uh, their members of the court and or committees that have similar uh, roles, uh, they also work on, on an honorary or on a pro bono basis. So, but this particular feature or this particular so-called standard um, has also enabled us to uh, come up with, uh, with this unique feature, which is, the, uh, which is um, zero admin fee. Um, there is another aspect that I wanted to emphasize um, and um, which we emphasize time uh, and time again. Uh, TIAC is a totally independent institution which doesn't receive any funding or financial support from the government and or the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which is the founding member of TIAC. Um, in other words, myself, uh, other employees of the center and or the members of the TIAC secretary, they, we, we don't get any salary from, from uh, the government and or the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, reason number two, we've got the strictest uh, standards in the industry when it comes to no conflict rules, as well as the most prestigious arbitrators on our panel. This was a uh, strategic decision that uh, we have made um, at the center's um, inception upon, upon its establishment. And it was driven by the feedback that we've received from um, our uh, users who were, uh, so to say, disapproving some of the procedures uh, at other arbitral institutions that um, used to operate in, in, the, uh, in the Central Asian region. And um, it, it, it was very important for us to create an environment where any potential or any um, situation with even far-fetched conflict of interest is excluded. So under the um, TIAC institutional framework, uh, TIAC staff and uh, TIAC Court of Arbitration members cannot act as arbitrators under the TIAC rules of arbitration. And um, another uh, also uh, important feature is that uh, only 20% of the TIAC court members can be Uzbek nationals. And as of today, uh, we've got only one member from Uzbekistan. Uh, I've also mentioned that we've got the most prestigious arbitrators on the TIAC panel. And uh, I frequently refer to, uh, to, to the TIAC panel as the replica of the uh, panel of such institutions like um, the um, including exit, uh, permanent court of arbitration, institutional memory of the ICC court of arbitration, LCIA, Dubai International Arbitration, and um, others. And number three, uh, state of the art rules of arbitration. Uh, this is uh, also important for us to, um, to emphasize, in addition to having a zero admin fee, we have the flexibility on the method of compensating arbitrators. So uh, users may either choose to pay the arbitrators based on an ad valorem basis, or in other words, based on the value of the dispute, uh, which is the default mechanism of compensation, or um, agree to pay at an hourly rate. Um, it's also important to note here that most institutions, uh, they offer um, either of these two options. Also tribunal under the TIAC rules um, has wide powers, including the power to order security for costs and uh, various interim measures. Uh, confidentiality provisions also extend, um, among others, to the fact 
or existence of arbitration. Again, this is not covered by and large uh, by most uh, institutional rules, so it was important for us to emphasize. This is the distinctive feature. Um, we uh, Another um, important innovation that we've introduced into the TIAC rules is the power of the tribunal to issue an order determination um, within 60 days on a point of law or a fact which is manifestly without merit or outside the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Um, we also have certain provisions related to third party funding arrangements, which I uh, it was included uh, because of the recent uh, trends in international arbitration. Number four, um, in addition to establishing TIAC in uh, 2018 and launching it in April 2019, another important milestone, as I mentioned, in strengthening uh, Uzbekistan's resolve to uh, become a preferred seat for um, a CIS um, arbitral proceedings was the recognition uh, by Ancitral uh, of Uzbekistan as a model law jurisdiction. Uh, as you can see also, Uzbek law has introduced immunity for arbitrators, which I think was also an important development, uh, particularly uh, in view of uh, certain news and developments that we've, uh, we've heard and uh, received from uh, regions like the Middle East. Um, last but not least, uh, foreign lawyers may not only represent their clients in arbitral proceedings without the need to uh, obtain the license from the Uzbek bar, but they can also do so in other arbitration related court proceedings in Uzbekistan. Uh, there are also uh, other uh, wide incentives that were granted um, under the TIAG decree uh, establishing the center, and these incentives include um, no VAT charges, so VAT uh, is not charged on filing and arbitrator's fees, and if you uh, notice in the very beginning when we provided the table, um, there was mentioned that, um, that there's no VAT applicable on the uh, filing and arbitrator's fees. Um, another important incentive uh, potentially for foreign arbitrators is, is the fact that their income is not taxable in Uzbekistan. By income, I mean their uh, arbitrator's fees that they receive as part of the arbitral proceedings um, uh, governed by the TIA crews. And um, last but not least, at least in this summary, is the fact that uh, online arbitral hearings and online case management are formally uh, and expressly mentioned and encouraged by the TIAG decree. This was uh, very important and very relevant, particularly in view of the lockdown measures introduced by the governments um, during the pandemic. And um, um, thankfully, we, we have had this in, uh, under our institutional framework. Here is a very uh, brief um, snapshot of the statistics. So the number of uh, cases uh, since the launch in uh, 2019, we've received um, 22 requests for arbitration under the TIAC rules of arbitration and uh, two applications for emergency relief. Um, you can also see on the slide the geography of the parties and uh, it uh, spans over 10 jurisdictions and you can see um, jurisdiction, jurisdictions like um, Kazakhstan, Russian Federation, of course, um, Singapore, Netherlands, uh, China and Hong Kong, which, which actually um, constitute uh, about 50% of the, of, of the case uh, loads uh, in, in TIAC. Um, there are um, a number of TIAC activities that were undertaken uh, as part of the, our mandate to promote the use of arbitration. One of them is, is, is the launch of the TechMoot. Uh, you can refer to the website for more information, but very briefly, uh, it is a simulation exercise uh, which will be governed by the uh, TIAC uh, rules of arbitration for technology disputes, uh, which we have developed uh, in uh, cooperation with the Young Practitioners Group of the Silicon Valley Arbitration and Mediation Center. Uh, this is an international mood competition and uh, students from all over the world have already demonstrated interest and registered to, to, uh, to participate. 
Um, we uh, are uh, launching very soon a TIAC mediation rules as part of our mandate to set up a framework for dispute avoidance. Uh, for, uh, again, the first time in history in, in September two, uh, 2021, uh, we will be launching um, the Uzbek Arbitration Week. Uh, you can um, look up um, further information on the website that we've provided. As part of our uh, PR activities, we've signed a number of MOUs and reached agreements with a number of institutions. Uh, and uh, um, you can see that there is also a reference to the Supreme Court of Uzbekistan. And uh, uh, this is, I think, uh, very important to facilitate the communications between uh, an arbitral institution and um, our local courts. Uh, so we've initiated uh, a number of capacity building workshops for the Uzbekistan judges. Again, uh, this is um, this is important of, uh, within uh, the framework uh, to promote Uzbekistan as an arbitration friendly jurisdiction and a preferred seat for uh, the disputes uh, with the CIS um, element and um, to conclude, a TIAC clause was also incorporated into the model investment agreement between the government of Uzbekistan and uh, prospective investors under the decree of the cabinet of ministers 264. Again, this is the model investment agreement. Um, and uh, we are currently uh, speaking and uh, uh, negotiating with a number of investors to ensure that the, the clause, uh, the TIAC arbitration clause stays there. So we uh, hope that uh, in the nearest future we will receive um, certain um, interest uh, and or potentially even um, not necessarily uh, arbitration, but potentially even request for mediation under under the uh, TIAC mediation rules. I think this is it for today. And um, I would like to give back the floor to Nata. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana, for very, very interesting, um, uh, you know, t telling us about this interesting developments in Uzbekistan. I personally was very interested in hearing all this. And of course, thanks to all of you. Um, we are, of course, close to the end. But I think if, if nobody objects to this, um, since there have been questions and thanks to you, many of the questions have already been answered. Um, I think we could um, delay the end of the, the webinar um, slightly. Um, I would have uh, one question. I think, um, first of all, I would like to summarize how different the situation is in the CIS region, as we've heard today. I mean, starting with Azerbaijan, we have seen very hopeful developments in terms of the, the new law on mediation being adopted, but yet Anar mentioned how the, the quasi-mediation um, is something um, that brings uh, uncertainties uh, potentially. And then we moved to Armenia, where we have seen that you know, Armenia has adopted the model law, has, uh, has a, um, a system which could work for arbitration, yet there is a lot of work to do in raising the awareness for arbitration and, of course, mediation as well. Um, but the interesting development being Yerevan Arbitration Institution being launched very soon. And I think we all look forward to hearing the news about that. Going to Belarus, very positive developments, um, arbitrage, very arbitration friendly legislation, growing number of cases and the new arbitration institution and new rules. So I think kudos to Belarus on the recent developments and I'm sure the trends going forward will be good as well. Um, I think mediation still has um, to be made popular in, in Belarus, as Oksana mentioned. So I think I'll come back to that um, later. In Kazakhstan, Valikan has told us not to go to AIFC in arbitration, um, being um, a, a parallel jurisdiction. Um, and I actually did not know that the, the Kazakhstan had not officially ratified the New York Convention and the European Convention. So thanks, Valikan, for that. Um, Russia being trendsetter um, in commercial and investment arbitration, 
that is no surprise, I think, to to any of us sitting here today. Um, and um, yeah, we we heard, of course, about a very successful arbitration reform um, in in Russia as well. Um, I we haven't heard about mediation, so maybe um, uh, we we come back to mediation regarding um, all all the speakers actually later. And finally, Uzbekistan hearing very positive developments with the launch of TIAC. Um, the very up and coming arbitration institution with great incentives actually to bring cases there. So I think we will all be watching um, with interest how TIAC develops further, especially also with setting up the mediation rules as well. I hope I did not summarize this um, uh, by making any mistakes to what the conclusions were out of your presentations. I think the question, uh, my first question would be whether you have been seeing um, during COVID pandemic, especially um, more settlements um, and um, disputes than what you had seen before. And while this settlement is happening, if you have seen mediation or conciliation being used or whether the negotiation was the primary um, source of ADR to, to settle the disputes. I think we, if the, we go back to the poll question number one, the audience at least has answered that negotiation has been the most famous dispute resolution means. So if, if any of you could um, reflect on your practice, whether you are seeing more settlement and what means of, of, of ADR is used to settle disputes. I'm guessing none of you would like to answer this question. <laughs> Well, I think I, I may want, yeah, please go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. You, you were first, go ahead. Well, we've definitely seen uh, even uh, from, from, from uh, the caseload that we've administered that the number of uh, users, the number of parties have actually um, settled the dispute uh, prior to receiving their uh, final arbitral awards. So this is definitely, I think, in line with the uh, with what the poll um, answers were. So that's just the- uh, So, so uh, it the, confirms, okay. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just want to say that uh, particularly in uh, uh, jurisdictions where the level of predictability is not very high, it's always uh, better to negotiate. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is what we always advise the client. Uh, right. The other thing is that, or, I mean, most of our, the majority of our clients uh, run their arbitrations outside of Kazakhstan, but with Kazakh law as the contract governing law. So we've seen uh, recently during the pandemic, one arbitration run in Paris with Kazakh law as contracts governing law. It was a construction dispute and the other one is uh, in uh, Switzerland. Um, uh, but uh, all of those arbitrations proceed without delay uh, through the online platforms. So even hearings are run online. So I haven't seen any like impediments to the, uh, I, I think initially there was a fear and discomfort. I mean, as you all know, but uh, generally I haven't noticed any like significant effect of pandemic onto the cause of arbitration proceedings. Thank you, Valka. Thank you, Diana. Unless any of you would like to comment on this question, we have a new question that has not been answered yet by you um, from Inga Kachevska from, from uh, Latvia. Um, her question is, if it is possible to hear consumer disputes in arbitration in your respective jurisdictions? By I think by raising hand, uh, we could we could start. Whoever would like to start answering this question. So I can say about uh, Belarus. So if, um, as I said uh, before in my presentation, we have uh, several number of domestic arbitration courts without a status of international but domestic arbitration courts. We have a special law on such uh, arbitration courts or third party courts and uh, 
Yes, such disputes uh, can uh, be resolved, but it's no if you speak about concluding a contract with a model clause uh, or when, uh, for example, producers or sellers uh, to, um, to offer to consumers some uh, mandatory provision, provisions of the contract, so it's prohibited to enforce the consumers to go to arbitration courts. But if the parties agree on such a method of uh, dispute resolution so domestic arbitration can resolve such dispute but frankly speaking it happens uh, um, i i do not remember such cases uh, in our practice because consumers prefer to go to state courts because maybe it's uh, they believe in state courts more than in arbitration because for consumers for physical persons uh, arbitration is just uh, something strange strange thank you oksana I think what we heard earlier from at least Aram's um, presentation was my understanding is that actually in Armenia, consumer arbitration is allowed and that that is actually one of the, because I think you, you mentioned Aram, the, the commercial um, banks that have disputes with consumers. So I'm guessing that like in Georgia, unfortunately, um, in Georgia, that's still a big issue with, with consumer arbitration, so. Yes, I agree. If we are uh, talking about if we are referring to consumer arbitration from this perspective, like uh, considering this arbitration as a consumer arbitration, yes, that these mm -hmm. are the main um, sector or main package of the cases that we have now in Armenia. But uh, the reality is that uh, these uh, uh, type of arbitrations um, are not uh, seen, uh, it's not very supported by the uh, national courts. Why? Because there are certain cases uh, where the courts uh, discuss the validity of such, such, such an arbitration agreements, uh, considers that uh, not all the issues can be arbitrable, uh, like the validity of entire loan agreement uh, cannot be considered by arbitration tribunal. Why? Because uh, they this this uh, restrictive approach to that kind of arbitration is coming from the the reality that the uh, arbitrators within these financial arbitration institutions are coming from the banks, like they are some officials from the banks. Uh, so they are more inclined to protect bank interests. Uh, from uh, for, from this perspective, I can say again, repeat that uh, national courts are uh, somehow reluctant to support these kind of arbitrations. It may be in future we will uh, uh, we will have uh, a decrease of these cases, uh, but uh, let's see how it will. De uh, develop in future. But from my own perspective, I'm not really. Uh, considering uh, these uh, cases as a, a kind of a real arbitration, because this is a, a very limited and uh, somehow the, the citizens or the clients, yeah. physical entities are enforced to go to, to this type of arbitration. So the very future, so the concept of arbitration is, good, is uh, really not that clear. Yeah. Thank you, Aram. Would anyone else, I think I have one last question because we actually, yeah, Valikan, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, it's not uh, my field, but as far as I know, uh, generally the uh, disputes between consumers and the uh, counterparties are uh, arbitrable, except for disputes between consumers and natural monopolies, which are not arbitrable under the Kazakh law on arbitration. Thank you very much. Well, the same would apply to Azerbaijan if there is an agreement between the consumer and the, let's say the manufacturer, which provides for the re re referral of the disputes to the arbitration, then such uh, arbitration agreement will be considered valid and the parties may refer the dispute to the arbitration. I also yeah, have to... Similarly in Uzbekistan, it's a quite... Um, 
um, under under the under the law uh, on domestic arbitration uh, courts uh, that are. Um, generally three t categories of disputes that, that are not arbitrable and um, these are uh, labor law disputes uh, administrative and family disputes these are not arbitrable everything else uh, largely um, can be the subject of the of an arbitration agreement thank you diana um, alexander i think you yeah, were saying yeah. something yeah i have to confirm that at least formally in russia uh, consumer disputes are arbitrable uh, and uh, these questions were settled in uh, court practice in 2015, but it was before the reform. So now we do not show. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think the very last question I had and, and a similar question was asked in the Q&A um, is we have heard that in, in several countries, mediation is not popular. And for instance, in some jurisdictions like Armenia, still arbitration is, is uh, not popular. So what do you think as practitioners and leaders also of, of arbitral institutions um, can be done to raise awareness um, in, in CIS region, in your respective jurisdictions about mediation, arbitration and ADR? in general and whether this is actually useful to do so. Um. Well, um, I mentioned that SIAC will be launching very soon uh, mediation services as part of its mandate to, um, to, to, to promote dispute avoidance rather than even dispute resolution. There are definitely a number of challenges uh, that may arise in the course of the mediation proceedings. And uh, we see this as uh, an opportunity for us to uh, work closely with our users and potentially with uh, um, with, uh, uh, with, with the government of Uzbekistan to, uh, to facilitate communications because communications, you know, is, is part of the uh, dispute avoidance strategy. Um, and another challenge which has been uh, re repetitively uh, raised uh, by uh, the experts who helped us develop uh, the mediation rules was the issue of um, uh, the capacity to sign mediation agreement. Uh, I think this is something that uh, we uh, as an institution may need to um, look into and to again encourage the communications between uh, the, the various users, uh, but there's definitely a very interesting area and we see this as a, a means to um, avoid disputes and to avoid arbitration uh, with our involvement. Thank you, Diana. Uh, from my side, I can say that uh, my point is that both for arbitration and mediation in our region, uh, we have problem with mentality of uh, people probably because uh, from my experience, I can say that the uh, national courts in any case uh, consider it being more reputable than the private entities that are going to solve the problem. So. Yes, the awareness is the main point uh, and the main way that we need to go. Uh, we need to tell people to, to, uh, to do a lot of propaganda on the, the main advantages for both arbitration and mediation. Otherwise, these people are going again to, to approach courts for uh, solving their disputes. Thank you. I think I, I, I fully agree. Yes, Valikan, go, go ahead. Well, uh, I think uh, it would be very useful to start with opening up access to the court practice to allow the participants of the market to see what the rules of the game are. Uh, because we still don't know, even as far as it concerns the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards, which is, I mean, a fundamental uh, fundamental uh, issue for uh, foreign investors. We still don't know whether there is any consistent court practice. I think this would be the first, uh, the first step. The second step would be uh, to, um, to 
improve the standards of uh, arbitration uh, based on the ancestral law, uh, Modal law, because uh, while it is declared that Kazakhstan legislation is based on the ancestral Modal law, I mean, in fact, it is not. And I think like eliminating uh, restrictions uh, to arbitration would significantly improve the situation. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to comment? I think for, from my perspective, also coming from the same region, I think I agree that a lot of it is is uh, mentality, um, and but it is also the the awareness. You know, we need to work on all the levels, being students who are studying at the university, and they need to be made aware of possibilities of ADR. Unfortunately, when I went to law school, that was not a subject that was taught as such at the universities. And then, of course, work with the practitioners, lawyers who draft the contracts and represent the parties, as well as with the judiciary. Um, I think unless we, we, we do that in all the entire region on all the levels, um, it would be hard to um, promote ADR um, uh, uh, generally as dispute resolution. Um, unless any of you have comments, we have exceeded our time significantly. I would like to thank all of you for taking your time um, for, to, to join us today to deliver such important and interesting presentations. Um, I would like to thank, of course, uh, the, the Chartered Institute of Arbitration who has organized this, this great ADR world tour that has allowed us to see what is the situation in terms of using ADR throughout the world. Um, so virtual applaud to all of you um thanks to all the the attendees um who have joined and stayed with us um although we have exceeded time so hopeful i hope to meet and see all of you um very soon also in person thank you very much thank you thank, thank you bye thank you bye bye, bye.